Russet mites are, are toxic to the plant, different than a normal mite. So a normal mite basically drains a plant of its sap and dehydrates it, like, like a little baby vampire, tick, flea. Think of it like that. A russet mite would be more like a, like a brown recluse bite, where, where it has toxins that kill the plant and thin it out. So what you see is in vegetative growth, you'll see plants that suddenly look where, where the stems on the new growth look half the thickness of the old growth. And you, you almost characteristically see incredible leaf roll up as if it was a magnesium deficiency. And you, you notice a very paling in color, almost like it's a zinc iron deficiency. So you see all these weird little signs. And none of them would be present normally, and all of a sudden you start to see them. You'll typically see these problems in the lower leaves first because russets usually come in from the bottom and come up. But the bottom line is if it's windborne, which I know it had to have been on my farm, they landed on the top of the damn plant. They landed all over the plant. And so we, we look for these damages. Now, in vegetative, it's, you can see it. And if it's in vegetative, I think sulfur couldn't be a better choice because for us as cannabis farmers with the prices we're facing, the idea of using extremely expensive control methodologies is really not applicable. And, and I, I like, and it's not to knock enzymatics, I like enzymatics. And they work well if one understands how to use it and if one understands that they are rough on the epidural layer of plants just like sulfur can be. So both of them can chew up a plant a little bit, but sulfur is exceptionally cost effective. You just can't use sulfur in flour. It will, it will flavor the cannabis and it will flavor the extract. So sulfur is something you can't use once we're into flour. But all through vegetative purpose, it's fantastic, fantastic miticide too, and, and absolutely aggressive on all insects. And can you do it, uh, it while sunlight is on the plant? Or just do it in the wait? morning. All, all sprays should be done in the morning when the plant has it heated up chemically. And you can lay this on and, and just follow your uh, IPM programs. The problem with using sulfur is if you mix it with like an agricultural oil, and they start to become aggressive on the leaf surface. When you're using sulfur, you have to really agitate the material, otherwise it comes out in, in, in too much of a heavy chunk. And so enzymatics can bleach a leaf, sulfur can bleach a leaf. Um, potassium bicarbonate, which you use for powdery mildew, same thing, if you don't shake that up enough, it'll leaf bleach. And so all products have, an, have a phytotoxicity to a degree if it's too concentrated. But ultimately, you know, potassium bicarbonate couldn't be any cheaper to use for powdery mildew control and uh, sulfur couldn't be any cheaper to use as an as a antifungicide and a, a pest control. But once we get into flower, now to me, the only thing that you really want to work with there is predation. And predation is, is like I said, is really simple. It's just what you're going to do is you're going to talk to your bug company and you're going to tell them what your environmental conditions are and if it's indoor outdoor. And these things really make a difference in the reproductive rates, quantity, and delivery. And so because entomology study of bugs is so complex, I, I always work with a bug supplier, so you'll find one that you want to work with. Um, my guy's out of Oregon, and he's my consultant on it. What we do is we've just had him come in and help us understand uh, pest IPM, and then we uh, run by him, you know, what we're working with and anything new in the world, because remember, people breed these bugs, create these bugs for these purposes, and as, as, as pathogens change, the bugs need to change, and if you're in a situation where it's colder and wetter, you need something different than a predator that likes it hotter and drier. And so this is a speciality. This isn't where you just go grab some, uh, a couple of, uh, what I say, uh, ladybugs from the local store and just throw them in your grow room. It's not that simple, but it's really that simple once you get down to it, where you're just applying living predation to do the work. And then what you have is you have plants that are not covered with any kind of product at all. So now you can really sell these plants in the concentrate market, which for a lot of people is where a lot of this should be going, because the, the concentrate market's a huge market. And for a lot of people that have bulk cannabis that no longer has a black market value and it's got a very slow white market value, it has excellent value in concentrate if it can be made into concentrate. So everybody keeps talking about this eight times increase of cannabis in California where the legal market has got eight times the amount of pot. Eight times the amount of clean pot? So if 88% of the cannabis in California 
is considered dirty and unsellable. That means only 12% of the total exists. Well, 12 times 8 is 96, so that gives it right back up to 100 again. So I don't, I don't think we have eight times the cannabis in the state that people think we do. I think they have eight times too much pot, but not cannabis, not medical-grade cannabis, not food-grade cannabis, not testable cannabis. And so the whole point of this is, is to get the farmers to be able to get a product that makes it through these tests because these tests, they're going to hold your batch. It's not going to be where in the past you could take a sample and if it failed, well then you could go and find another source for that cannabis. But as we go forward, the distributors will hold the batch lot and then the test invalidates the batch lot. And now you have a, a batch lot that's invalidated and the state will make you take it off your inventory on all your track and trace. The, the, the majority of individuals who are in cannabis do not really understand what regula regulated cannabis is. They're all 215 guys and they sell to the dispensary. They're not running anything legal in any way, shape, or form in terms of a real legal transaction. The real transactions are gonna occur through a highly regulated track and trace methodology that's gonna be able to hold batches and then determine these batches are no longer good. These batches will have batch lots. If a batch makes it through the system and comes out dirty, they'll go back and track it. You'll be held liable. There'll be class action lawsuits because all the states have followed suit with this. So this is something that you've got to be crystal clear about. You want to create products that have nothing on them that will cause you problems or the people problems because it's, it's, it's above moral. It's, it's a legal issue now. So for people whose morality is a little askew, well, their wallet's going to be a little askew too. So one of those should get you back on track. So with russet mites, what are some of the uh, ways that fighting russet mites can make your cannabis dirty can you talk about so you're saying sulfur is safe to use mm -hmm. but only up until uh, only up until flower most people trying to use just different pesticides that you can use it, russet mites aren't hard to kill pesticide so there's a tremendous different number of families of pesticides that one can use that are all available illegally everybody if you're a grower you know how to get illegal pesticides because they're, they're not hard to get and any of those families of illegal pesticides work and the bottom and no, I'm not gonna tell you which ones to use because then you're gonna go use them Sulfur and beneficials is what you need to know. And, and enzymatics, if you're able to work with that also, though that's, those are good strategies. The main point is that you have to be highly vigilant on your plant. And I think for a lot of individuals, when you're running new cultivars, you don't know what to expect. So you start to see changes in performance and you don't know if it's what's supposed to happen. And I think that in the test plants and plants we don't know is where we get the problems first because we don't see it quickly. So plants that you're most familiar with, you'll be able to do an ID on. And if you're really doing what you're supposed to be doing, which is actually keeping an eye on the crop, you're walking through your fields and you're looking for changes. And if everything looks the same, then it's easy to see what doesn't match. When people do a shoddy job, then everything looks different. And then one can't find the unusual, one has to find something that is just different. When everything's different, it's impossible. So if you're doing a good gardening practice where you standardize on what you're doing, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna be able to go through and in, and in veg you'll start to see this change in the apical tips of your plants where they literally look like they're radically thinner and smaller and paler with extreme zinc and iron and ag deficiency all in one shot. And you're gonna go, there's no way I have this problem because the rest of the plant looks great. At that point, you gotta get yourself a good quality microscope loops and get down into these leaves and start, remember they, they all the russets and broads, they hide in the, the node. So they burrow, so they're tough to see and they move quickly. So you almost can never see the bug itself. But what you'll see is little silicone nodules, that's your egg sacs. So if you can find some, you can find the damage and then flip the leaves and look for these little trails of egg, you clearly know. And as soon as you see that top growth, don't think you're having a nutrient problem. Where did it suddenly happen? It wouldn't. You would not go from full health to no health overnight. And it's quick. This has happened over a period of like a week or two. You've seen a sudden change. This isn't slowly happening. It happens quick. And then it, you have to respond to it. And if you can respond to it, you can get the plant to get this toxin out of its system through more vegetative growth. And maybe we only get in a heavy infestation only half of what we were gonna get, a third of what we were gonna get, but it's better than none. And I think that the farmers have to see that, but once they're aware of that, this is something that exists in the world, you just know that you should be spraying your vegetative plants and keep them healthy as an inoculation, as IPM. And then you treat the flower and plants, like I said, with the beneficials the whole time. And if you see 
you know, a wave that come in because you have an infestation at a neighbor's garden, then we can add adults. But you only you don't you don't have to add adults and juveniles if you're trying to do protection. The juveniles are all you have to add. The adults come out free hungry. So they're ravenous and so they'll just eat the population up. But the juveniles release over the course of a month out of a sat of a satchel. They're these little basically look like a dryer sheet with a little hook. And inside them uh, different types of mites exist, different types of predator bugs, depending on what we're trying to kill. And you hang these on the plant about six to eight inches off the bottom. So this way as they release, they move up and start to colonize through the plant chasing the, the russet. And we'll, you know, as we go forward, we'll find better methods to deal with all this, biologically speaking. But right now, it's, it's pretty much uh, equivalent to the fire. So the russet probably took out as much cannabis as the fire took out. This year. Oh, easy. Yeah. Can you easy. go back to talking more about why the russet mite has been such a big problem this year? And are you seeing that throughout Southern Humboldt County? Or um... Russet mites everywhere. It's all through California now. It's, yeah. been, it's been spread everywhere. Russet mites all over the United States. It, it, because, because plants move all over the United States. So people have russet on indoor all over the place now because that's, that's a buffered environment. And you have russet all over Mendo, all over Humboldt. A lot of it is it's in all the neighborhood gardens. Where that's, where, that's where I see it most, where you have all, everybody who has a home garden in the yard, russet mites came through. So they come in through some Air. other plant that yeah. came, got, came it, from it, the nursery. It, 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 typically, no. See, I don't, and, I, and, and, I don't, and I'm not saying that because I have a nursery, because I don't think the russets are coming from everybody's nursery. So sometimes, yeah, some russets might be coming from a nursery, but you would damn well know you had russet at your nursery, because what does russet prevent? Propagation. So if the mothers are covered in russets, they're not striking roots. So it's hard to have a russet mite infestation and sell the russet mite clones because you're not going to produce any russet mite clones because they don't want to root. So you end up having pathogens that might get on the clones themselves, but typically if the mothers are infested with russet mites, they don't want to strike a, a root. And so what I know is that's, that's how we learned what these were from the initial. I got broad mites in a nursery probably nine years ago. Got them into a flower room, got them in nursery. And it completely changed the propagation rates, and that's how we knew it wiped out an entire operation. So what we know is that if we use IPM correctly, and we're using sulfurs and we're using frasses on, on the nursery here too, the frass is good for all the spider mite eggs, that uh, we compost it, brew it up so we get a little concentrated, and then we just fold or spray the whole facility with it every couple of days. Insect frass works really well on most eggs and sulfur to kill anything else. But the mite problems are predominantly people are not aware of this problem. And so most growers are growers, but does that mean that you're a professional farmer? You know, you get tomatoes in your backyard. Does that mean you have an ag degree? That means you, you don't identify that? And you don't need an ag degree to identify it, but are you that involved? So like ultimately, what is your level of involvement in the thing you're in? Most people with cannabis, 20% involvement. You don't have a full-time involvement, you're gonna to come to your patch and go, wow, I don't know what's wrong with it. Then a week later, you go, wow, it's dying. And then a week later, it's died. And then you go, I got russet mite. So then you go online to the crop that's in 20% infestation, and the, the news is to burn it to the ground and kill every plant and burn, and I'm laughing, I'm like, and you're gonna burn your neighbor's crop too, and you're gonna burn the, the world around you. Anybody tells you to burn your crop, and they're giving you some horrible advice, that maybe they'll share their crop with you. What you want to do is you want to fight the problem, and I'm telling you, organic, organic biology can really control this to a degree. You just have to be able to spend the money to do it. And that's where you're going to have to figure out, is the cost worth what you're about to grow or lose? And I just think that as these problems become more and more prevalent, people become smarter and smarter on how they deal with them. They'll be able to understand what to do. You don't see a lot of the issues that we saw prior. You know, I'd say the powdery mildew issues don't seem to be so prevalent because people started to learn how to grow OG. They started to realize that you can't grow it in north slopes. You can't grow it in shady areas. If you overfeed it, it'll get PM. If you dep it and you don't vent it, it'll get PM. And so pretty soon people started venting the dep. They started, they started lack of overfeeding. And they don't grow OG in situations where you're going to get pathogenic issues. And so lo and behold, the amount of OG that's available this year that isn't fungally infected, that's clean, is high because 20 years after growing the cultivar, people kind of figured out what to do. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna have the same thing with russet, is the people in 20 years will figure out, we know what to do with it. And, when, and the, the easier the solution, the less people wanna take it. Because if it's kicking their ass, it must be really complicated. 
and it's really not. It's just this is what you got to do, but you got to work on it. And we figured out. We went. We tried a lot of different methods, but I'm I'm really happy with what we've done this year. And I I like the fact that the nursery is able to contain all the issues. And I had I had Russet come in here one year and hit my CBD bed, and it, same thing. Airborne, blew right in. All airborne, windborne, blew in from somewhere. Someone had a truckload of something in dirt, maybe who knows? But it blew in and got in the building. And we saw it on those CBDs, and that's where I know that I said, listen, I'm going to attack this thing agriculturally. I'm going to knock it out with sulfur. And we blasted it out, blasted it out of the building, never had to come back. And I, I challenge people, come through the loop and find it. There's no russet in the damn building. We wiped it out of the building, and we wiped it off those cultivars because what, we're going to burn the building down? Like, really, you know? So you have the tools to use, and what you're going to find is, like, for me personally, I noticed that the, the issues are primarily in plants that are older. So what I saw myself was that in plants that had the most infestation, it was older cultivars, meaning, you know, stuff from the 90s. Things have been, you know, cut and 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 cut. And if you chose cultivars that had low vigor, so sometimes some cultivars which were poorly chosen where they like the product, but they should have went through another 150 seeds and found the one that also grew heartily. And those are prone. So if the immune system, you know, plants technically don't have one, but let's just use it as a way to explain it. If the immune system is reduced, then this problem is real. So in plants that are healthy and solid, they can fight it with very little help. And plants that are compromised, they don't do well at all. And so what that means is that on your strain list, just whatever got hammered this year, don't grow next year. Just realize that that's how you approach it in ag. There's whether the market wants it or not, if it can't be produced, the market can't have it. And so that's just how it is. And someone else will produce it where they can. You need to find what works for you in your garden, works for you in your environment. And, and, and predation and control of these pathogens is part of that. What works for you where you're at and what can you use to not make it so important. I'd rather have cultivars that didn't need the help because that's just more money I have to keep spending. And when pounds were a lot more valuable, I don't think anybody even cared. I mean, just spend the money. You're seeing people breaking out calculators right now for the first time on their phone when they go to the grocery store. So my whole purpose on this this whole time is to be agriculturally efficient because that way we're able to actually survive. And so I would recommend all people to really look at it from that perspective. Take a look at how you would approach this from food grade um, food production because the needs are the same and just go that route. Anything else you think people should know about Russet mites. You covered a lot of area. I think it's pretty good. You, it's you got it. The, um, be diligent and be proactive. And when you do have it, man, be reactive. Move your feet.